should see a pop up and we are live i'm excited for this this is gonna yeah. be fun i had um i don't think i told you but there was someone in particular in my discord that i had mentioned doing the stream and they were like specifically waiting for for it to come so there's at least a handful of people in discord specifically that were looking forward to it yeah the i saw i saw on your tweet last week um, I think there were a few replies to the tweet about highlight, which was which made mm -hmm. us feel good. That was that's nice. cool. Excited to show it to people. Yeah. How long? I guess we haven't. Oh, uh, so the person I mentioned or was talking about is actually Christian, who just joined. So Christian, okay. who is joining us from YouTube, I was just saying that you were specifically interested in um, in this stream. So I'm glad glad you made it. Yeah. Hey, Christian. What's up? Welcome. That sounds. Um, I'm going to send a tweet now that's out for people. I wanted to link the stream to some folks. Should I? Oh, there we go. Yeah, so you can use either the Twitch. Uh, so twitch.tv.com slash James Q quick. Or um, I can send you the link to the YouTube. Either one is fine. Twitch works. Twitch works. I'll send that out. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, do that um code with aus what's up mastermind hello correct hello i just found out this is completely random but someone a friend of mine that i play soccer with is from the uk and his name is mark goes but oh he's polish and his name is actually marek m-a-r-e-k and so someone was spelling his name m-a-r-e-k and i was like where is this coming from learned that his name is actually Marek and then he just kind of goes by Mark. So I thought that was interesting. Completely random, but and unrelated to the stream. No, no, no. That's interesting. Yeah. You play soccer a lot in Memphis, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't you know if we talked about like my wife played in college. So we we played co-ed together for 10 plus years. That's a big... It's usually one of the first things we do every time we've moved is like find our soccer community because that's where we make a lot of our friends. Nice. Nice. I like it. I like it. And I guess, yeah, Nash or Tennessee in general, the weather is pretty, pretty good all, all year round. Yeah. It, it's super hot in the summer is the big, thing. um, which is tough for me. Like I just don't do well in the heat. Unfortunately. Is it humid? Uh, yes. Very humid. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I see. I see. I see. Yeah. Um, Marek in the chat said that uh, their story is the same, Polish, but from the UK. That's wild. Nice. That's perfect. Nice, nice, nice. Small world, I guess. Yeah. I guess it happens for people a lot of just like making easier names, I guess, for countries that they end up going to. I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's a little more accessible. I know some people that are like, yeah, I feel like it goes both ways. It just depends on maybe the environment you're in. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Well, names aside, do you want to talk about what we're here to talk about? So welcome, everyone. Um, title of the stream is, is pretty obvious, but this is one that's particularly exciting for me because this is a world that I haven't really gotten into much, but I, I've heard of like the idea of like air tracking software or SaaS solutions or, or whatever you want to call it. Session replay is something that's really cool, monitoring, et cetera. I kind of know I've used different things professionally in the past, but I think they were probably like more outdated outdated, and I haven't used them on any of my like smaller projects or my first projects that I spend time on a consistent basis. So what we're gonna do is actually like we'll talk about highlight. We'll get handled with highlight and then we'll incorporate that into um, the learn, build, teach, Discord bot, which is a node express app. And then the front end for learn, build, teach.com, which is a stealth kit app. And we'll see how those two things integrate with each other uh, by tra tracking sessions on the front end. And then also being able to see like errors popping up on the back end and the association between the errors on the back end and the, um, and the session on the front end, which is pretty exciting. So anyway, all that said, uh, Jay, welcome to the stream. Do you want to introduce yourself first, give a little bit about your background, and then we can dive into like what Highlight is as we get into it hands-on? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. First of all, yeah, thanks for having me. We're excited to be here. Our whole time, our whole team is excited for this. Um, we've been kind of like 
yeah, these last few weeks doing a lot of preparation and it's kind of cool to see it come to fruition. Um, but yeah, it, about me, a little bit more about me. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Highlight. Um, and I, I don't know, I guess like my background is that I've been building full stack web apps for quite a few years at this point. And um, I think an emphasis on full stack where I think we realized that there's a lot of, there's a lot of like monitoring software out there, but it's either very, very strongly uh, emphasized on the back end or on the front end. And what we're really focused on highlight is kind of like co building like a cohesive product such that all of your monitoring kind of can come together such that you, anything goes wrong on the front end, anything goes on the wrong in the background, you get like a full stack mm -hmm. way see what's going on, if that makes sense. And I think it's also particularly exciting with things like Spelt Kit and Next.js and Remix, kind of frameworks that are kind of bridge the gap between front end and back end. Um, and we're kind of like putting our best foot forward in those types of frameworks such that ideally you put a little bit of code in your app and then we give you that full stack visibility that you need. You know what I mean? Um, so that's kind of, I guess, a, kind of a pain point that I experienced in the past. Um, I worked at a bunch of startups before this. Um, and so, yeah, I guess we've been building Highlight for a, a bit at this point. And I'm excited to kind of share with you all our thoughts, our yeah. vision on the future of sort of full stack monitoring and how it can help folks, um, how it can help folks like get more visibility into their web apps. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about me, a little bit about highlight. And then in terms of like the actual product, the, the way it kind of comes to fruition is we have like a session replay product where you, with just a few lines of code can install this in your Spelt Kit app, for example, which is what we're going to be doing today with James. Um, but then you can go as far as to install our error monitoring SDK on your backend. And we're also shipping a logging product where you can also attribute logs with errors and attribute errors with your session replay. And so imagine being able to actually, from a button click of a user, understand the kind of downstream effects of that in your web apps journey, right? Like a request goes out, an error gets thrown, a databa database call gets made, and then something goes wrong, right? Um, that's kind of the, 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 the long-term vision where you can just kind of be able to understand exactly what went wrong and trace that to exactly what happened on the front end. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a little bit about me, a little bit about the vision of Highlight and kind of what the product looks like right now. So Sweet. yeah, James, I'll let you kind of structure what comes next, but I'm happy to talk talk to talk to whatever we think is a good idea. Yeah. Well, we already had a comment in the chat from Kosh said that it's a lifesaver for junior devs as much as a great tool for senior devs. I think just the idea of like monitoring, session replay, et cetera, as a whole. And they said they've been looking into Log Rocket and Open Replay, so maybe this will be one for them to take a look at uh, yeah. going forward. Um, and if you, I think you'd probably agree, like as people have any ideas or specifically feedback as we go through the hands-on portion of this, like be very vocal about that. And especially if you have questions, leave those in the chat and we'll have uh, Jay and I to discuss. We've also got Vadim, who I think is on the Twitch side, just kind of watching in and if we need like, extra extra answers or anything in the background he'll be there to help answer that stuff too um a little a little bit of context for people um so what 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 i've been lacking is is exactly what we're talking about so i for the discord bot for learn build teach and this is our um our discord i'll put a link in the chat for anybody that is interested um it's a bot that does a few different things. Like a lot of it is kind of automation type stuff. So it has a few commands for people to share content. It has, um, it has ability to schedule now like weekly discussion questions, which I just launched, which I'm super excited about. It also like schedules events inside of discord automatically, which I think is pretty cool. So there's a few different things that happens in there. And then we also have the front end, um, spell kit application to go with that. And it's pretty basic, but you can find it in the link in the description below. Um, but the on the back end, if anything goes wrong, for the longest time, I was going in and looking into Heroku logs, which is just not an easy, not a great experience. And then I upgraded myself like to add to do an add on to that with Logtail. So it's just basically like a log aggregator. You can search through your logs, which like has helped. So basically like as something really, it would be like someone says the bot's not working in Discord and then I would go and look in the logs, which is again, not ideal. 
And then from the logs, like all I have is is just whatever I actually logged out. Not any idea of like what happened on the front end, what was the overall experience. So this is where we're gonna tie all this stuff um, together, which uh, should be should be super cool. Um, so CM Griffin and Vadman uh, just joined on Twitch. What's up, everyone? Um, so don't see any follow spam now confused i don't know what the the spam comment means hopefully there's no i don't see any spam in twitch hopefully there's not um anyway so let's see maybe i will share my screen here and uh so here's the highlight homepage. i do want to show really quickly first though two different things that we have so I have the Discord bot, and we're just going to kind of run this as is, running locally. And we're going to be testing with an endpoint in this, which is server insights. So this just shows right now, it just shows how many uh, users we have in Discord. That's all it returns, so it's fairly simple. And so it comes back with a piece of data and a property called total members, and it says five. This is because it's connected to my test Discord for transparency. Like the real Discord is much bigger than that. Uh, but this returns the five correctly, which is good. And then we also have the SvelteKit project that we can start running. And this is fairly basic. If anyone's interested in like contributing to this, please feel free. Uh, but it's got kind of a landing page. I think one of the coolest things is that it has a uh, content page. So this is all content from people inside of our Discord that have shared stuff. And then lastly, I stubbed out the server insights page. And we'll come back and actually update this. Right now, it's not really going to say much. So we'll add code to actually make a request to our backend. And then uh, trigger errors, see all those full stack, front end, back end, et cetera. And I think if you're ready, I think next step is just actually go into the dashboard and we'll create a new workspace. So we're starting completely from scratch, adding it to the front end first. Then we'll go to back end and we'll see the whole connection all the way through. Let's do it. Let's do it. Cool. And then, yeah, James, what the server insights is something that like you've been working on the last, like, like what's the long-term vision for that? Is it like just being able to understand the rest of your community and things like that? Yeah, I don't know. Um, some of it I think is to kind of figure out, like, I think, I think having a little like tag or something that kind of floats around that says like, here's how many members we have. I think that's cool. I don't know like what deeper insights I'll get to, but I figured like having a separate page for like, as we want to add more information, we can. But for now, at the very least, I'm thinking of having like a little button component that can show somewhere or float around on the page or something just to show how many people we have in the server. Nice. That sounds good. Yeah, let's yeah. do it. Let's do it. Uh, so I've got a bunch of stuff that we've done in previous demos, but we're going to start completely from scratch and we're going to create a new project and... I think the other one was learn, build, teach app. We'll call this learn, build, teach demo, for example. Create a project. Um, Starlight Soft on YouTube. Hello. Looks cool. I think it's cool. Uh, Jay probably thinks it's cool, but he's obviously biased. So. <laughs> I'm a bit partial, yeah. but I do think it's cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, we kind of get taken to snippets that we can add into our into our project and uh we specifically are looking for the svelte kit option do we yeah i think the svelte kit option isn't on our setup page think... yet but yeah. this is also this is this might be a good excuse to show people the docs actually yeah and for context this was uh specifically one like your team based on this being a svelte kit project like added this integration for this. So yep. um, it will be there, but it also like code wise and stuff is ready to go. So yeah, 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 That's yeah. Oh, kids, maybe. Oh, you might want to just, well, hmm. I would head you gotta to call out there. Yeah. I'll just head to the docs. docs yeah. yeah. And then just do a command K for Svelte kit. Ooh. How how does that work, by the way? Is that something like you built from scratch or maybe powered by Algolia here? Yeah. So originally we actually built it from scratch. Okay. But then, like you'd be surprised how complex doc searches. I'm not like, surprised. That yeah. makes total sense. 
kind of like if you want to have all your docs in locally on the page and then be able to search over it, you can't do it in the main thread without mm. it like blocking people typing. Yeah. You know I mean? Um, so yeah, we, we decided to just try out, we saw the super base docs. Actually, we were kind of inspired by that. We saw cool. that. And then Algolia has this cool thing where you can like point them to your doc site and they'll like, just like a web crawler, they'll just crawl your site. And they'll, they'll figure oh. out exactly the content and exactly the titles and all that. And then something that I learned recently is every couple of weeks, they'll send you an email that says, this is what people are searching for that they haven't found successfully. Hmm. So on and so forth. So you can sort of like over time, learn more about yeah, what people how people are for. using it. Yeah, it's kind of cool. That's super cool. It's, it's funny you mentioned that I'm so I'm, I'm working with Zeta on some content too. It's a serverless database, really cool for people who haven't checked it out. Yeah. And um, they literally have a demo very similar to that, while, like integrating into AI. So they they have some tools. We're actually going to do it on stream at some point soonish. So keep an eye out, people. But to scrape doc sites, ingest that into a Zeta database, which they have like search built in. And then they also have an AI layer on top of that where it has the things like, to search, but then it also uses AI to do, I forget what the word is, but it's like, it, it maybe it's semantic search where if I say uh, not the exact phrase, but a phrase related to it, it's going to pick up on that and then go and reference it in the docs. Um, I'm excited to see that like kind of an aside thing, but I thought that was really cool too. That is pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Maybe we should check that out. Yeah. <laughs> um, also fans of like different pieces of that workflow in the chat vadman for algolia doc search super cool um and then cm griffin said doc search really awesome and free open source too love that yeah 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 they're they're uh, and it's like completely free too if your docs are open source you don't pay for it which oh is cool even, you know but that is cool i love man yeah. there's so many good tools like it's so it's so good and that's maybe a really quick call out that's one of the things to call out with highlight as well as being open source right like that's, yeah, that's actually point. one of the big distinctions yeah 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 and i think like so yeah at a high level i think like we we do put a lot of effort into our hosted product so when people hit highlight.io we try to try to like get them we try to encourage them to sign up and like create an account and just get started pretty quickly but the real benefits we've noticed recently about being open source is the like if for example we meet james at some point and James wants to install highlight on Svelte, right? He could actually easily contribute a Svelte SDK yeah. and contribute to the docs, so on and so forth to kind of get things up and running. Um, and then I think the other thing that we've really noticed is like the trust aspect, which is like at the end of the day, you're installing highlight in your own app, right? And you want to know what is running in your what own it's app. doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we've seen, yeah, overall, I mean, we're really, ex we're, we're very bought into open source, of, of course, but um, those are, I think the big call outs, but that being said, we do have a way to like actually self host highlight. So some of our customers actually just install highlight in Docker and, and then own it completely the themselves. Yeah. Okay. And that's actually in the bottom left. If you want to click on that real quick, but there's like a hobby deployment guide mm, where if you okay. wanted to, you could actually just install highlight in your own repo, you know? But anyway. I'll throw a link. I'll throw a link to that in the chat, and then also for uh, the Svelte docs, which we are going through. That one, cool. Um, so we can come back to the Svelte kit example. So we'll go ahead and install package. So I am going to come to this one, install this package. So I'm going to use my tabs to come and put this in the middle. Cool, and then. I'm curious if like other people that are more experienced with Svelte can explain this better. The hooks file in Svelte kit. I, I like know in theory, like you can tap into different pieces of the request flow, but I, I've never like dove did in, <laughs> deep into it. But anyway, uh, there's a code snippet for, um, for a hooks.client.ts file, which I already have in here. And I am going to uncomment it. It's all the exact same. It's literally just a copy and paste from over here. So it's just kind of boilerplate getting started stuff. And the one thing we need to change, I actually closed my original um, tab. The one thing we need to change is adding the project ID. So I'll go back into uh, the dashboard and go and get that. Nibby in the chat from YouTube is asking, I think join a little bit late. Um, Coder Destin, Coding Muzz just joined on Twitch. 
Uh, Jay, while I'm doing this, do you want to just give like really quick 30 second uh, explanation of what highlight is again? Yeah, sure. Uh, hey guys, welcome. Um, the short pitch is that highlight is um, a full stack monitoring product and it's completely open source. So you can find us at github.com slash highlight slash highlight um, and as well as at highlight.io. And the idea and what kind of James is doing right now is we have a session replay product where you can install that on your front end. And that sort of gives you like front end monitoring for your web apps. But then we also have um, back end sort of more traditional monitoring on your server side. And we are very, very focused on kind of like pairing those two things together. So the idea is that you just put a few lines of code in your web app, which is what James is doing right now. And then anything that goes wrong, whether it be on your front end or your back end, um, we'll pair those two things together and kind of give you the, the full picture around any sort of bug or, or issue that happened on your web app. Make sense? I think I nailed it. And then Coding Muzz is also celebrating the open source piece of this. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I think it's also worth, worth noting that like we do have quite a few external contributors to highlight and we really do uh, appreciate those types of contrib contributions. So if you're interested in getting um, involved on that front, we have a Discord community at highlight.io slash community. And there we have like a contributing channel where you can like kind of say, Hey, I want to work on this. And, um, our whole team is there and we're happy to help on that front. But, um, yeah, we're big, we're big fans of open source too. There's a link to the community uh, or I, there's a link to the discord link in the chat. <laughs> it sounds repetitive. Um, right. okay. So what I did was I came back to the dashboard cause I'd accidentally closed that page. I grabbed in the finish setup. Um, in the first snippet that they show you, it doesn't really matter which one, but I just grabbed the uh, the ID of the project and I copied and pasted it into the SvelteKit specific um, setup. So this is inside of the hooks.client.ts file. This is the boilerplate snippet that they give you in the docs. Pasted it in, pasted in the project ID, and then started the application. So it's up and running, and that's what uh, that's what this tab is. And so from here, I can go around to the different pages. I can view content. I can view code of conduct. I wonder if there's anyone, is there anyone in the chat just out of curiosity that has any of our friends that like have content live on here? I don't think I see anyone. We got lots of awesome content creators in the community. Oh, um, yeah. It, yeah. It's one of like, it's one of my favorite things about it is like how much people create. Um, and I'm actually like kind of proud of like the aggregation of the content and being able to show it. Uh, anyway, I think it's cool. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the like the cool the cool thing about this is you're kind of acting as a platform for these folks, mm -hmm. where it's like, I don't know, content is only as good as its distribution. I feel like is what they say. <laughs> and um, yep. cool that it's cool that you're doing this. That makes Agreed. sense. Yeah. Uh, so I think like our what we're I was just kind of clicking around as part of the demo, and I think what I'll do is just close the tab now. And so that will maybe just at a high level, can you explain like what goes on? Like we added this stuff to SvelteKit. We started the application, we bounced around a little bit and then we closed the tab. What all is going on there behind the scenes? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, at the end of the day, highlight is just JavaScript that you add to your app, right? So you did, when you set this up, you did like an NPM install or a yarn add to your SvelteKit app and then you imported it and ran that init function, right? When you run that init function, the code that gets run under the hood actually pull, it doesn't pull, but it at, there's, a, there's an API called the Mutation Observer API. You can look this up actually, James, but um, it's like a Mozilla supported API on across all modern browsers. And basically what that does is give highlight access to changes that happen to the UI. But it happens at the HTML level rather than at the React level, which is why it's so easy for us, exam or sorry, not React, but like at the JavaScript level, mm -hmm. which is why it's so easy for us to add something like a SvelteKit, in, in, uh, SvelteKit integration, right? In any case, this Mutation Observer API gives highlight access to what happens in the DOM. And we, and DOM meaning in the UI, and we at the end of the day, start sending those changes across to our server and then expose it to you in the highlight dashboard under your project so that you can play through them. Um, Super so, cool stuff. 
I yeah. can't wait to show this. <laughs> and so the short is that like, yeah, you, you, and maybe why it takes a little bit of time and you got to close the tab and stuff is that you, uh, open up that localhost 3000, you click around a little bit. At, in the meantime, highlight sending data across to our servers. And then at some point you'll see a session um, and be able to play through exactly what happened in that UI along with a lot more things, which I imagine we'll talk about. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And there's still like another, um, another piece of that behind the scenes. I'm loading the dashboard now that I think is really cool because this uses um, web workers. Is that right? Like behind the scenes to um, to kind of batch, like it sends it off to, so it's not on the main processing thread, it sends it off to web workers to then send off uh, to your server. So it's not imp impacting performance of my application. Yep, yep, exactly. And it basically like cues those changes in, it cues those changes the, the, the second we get the data from the mutation observer API and sends it in the web worker and rather than doing it, rather than doing it on the main thread, you know what I mean? Yep, absolutely. Uh, Marco on YouTube says this is fantastic. Exactly what I've been looking for for the last three or four months. Uh, like the projects and guests bringing uh, great projects. Cool, that's perfect. Um, let's see if we can load. Since we um, can't, you... go ahead and change completed to live. Go oh, sorry. To... Um, go to sessions and then. And switch back to demo under this part. Is that what you're saying on the filter? Yeah. Change it to live. So just live. Because I, mm. I closed the tab. Should I open one back up? Um, maybe once. I also didn't. Um, I don't know if I if it may be because I like short circuited the setup part. Cause I didn't go, cause I kind of went my own way. Yeah, it might be. Page. Make sure that. Copy over. Oh yeah, let's Copy just page. confirm, James, that you copied the right project ID. The right one, yeah. Go to so finish. inside of. Are we on? Oh, page? I think it. Yeah, I think it is. I think it was switching to the previous one. Oh, interesting. When... That's a... Yep. Go to okay. So go to. You're, you're on the demo project. So go to the top left, top right, where that d three dots are. Uh, no. Oh, no. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then click setup there. That's the right one, yep. right? Okay. Yeah. So this is my fault. Yeah. I copied the wrong one. Good call. So let's do this whole thing over again. Sorry about that. And let's go to the should have loaded the new code now. Bounce around, look at stuff. I could open up an article. I could go to code of conduct, come back here. What's also really wild is it's not just like button clicks. We'll see this in a second. It's also like cursor, <laughs> which is wild to me. That's super cool because I think you'll actually be able to see this like moving around. Um, yeah. And the but other with thing, that there, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say like on the cursor side of things, I feel like the we were just talking about the web worker stuff and like, um, Maybe something worth sharing is like all the privacy stuff. Maybe when we see the session replays first, we can talk mm, about this. Yeah. But there's a lot of cool things you can do to kind of like redact data that you decide to uh, record. Because I imagine the folks out here, some of them are working on sort of more, I don't know, privacy sensitive apps. And that's something that we take pretty seriously. But let's, I think maybe a good first step is to try to see a replay and then go from there, you know? Yeah, agreed. Um, there's also just a quick call out. Something similar is in the configuration for highlight. There's the URL block list, which is like if you don't want it tracked on these um, on these subdomains or like whatever, however you want to do it, it can just not do any tracking there, right? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. Um, I am missing one of my interactions. So give me one second behind the scenes. I'm gonna go to. No, you're good. I'm going to comment on some comments. Maybe Banana nice. says, you guys are using all the tech. Kafka, ClickHouse, Postgres, Redis. Yep, you're right. Maybe Banana, we are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it. that's kind of one thing that we're, I, I mean, that's like a promise we make to our customers, right? Is that we're using, um, we're using open source all the way through. And it's not just our product that's open source, but it's all of the downstream databases and all the downstream things we use there. So, so for context on the Twitch side, 
I've been, I haven't worked with this in a while and I, it's not perfect by any means, but I have a command that will let people change the, the theme of VS code. And so there's other ones there. So the random theme command. So on Twitch, if you do exclamation random and then capital T theme, you should be able to, I, Vadman, I changed it. So now it's just random theme. You should be able to change the theme. This is like a really fun interaction, I think. Yeah. So I'll, we'll we'll let you all do that. And while we're uh, while we're doing that, I'm going to come back to uh, to the demo one and come back to sessions. And this should be 12:59. Yes, two, from two minutes ago. This should be uh, the session that uh, we just had. Did I close that tab out? I left that open, so it didn't actually close. So this is registered as a live tab. And after. A few seconds after like the live finishes, then we get the live like finish session replay. Is that right? Yeah, though you should be able to play through this at least to some extent if you click play here. And I think it would have it would have like been sitting a while back there too. So it may be because I didn't mean to leave that open. So I think that might have No, no, you're good, you're good. But yeah, live sessions are a bit weird. But if you do like yeah. a, a hard refresh here. You should be able to see oh, it. Let's come back to to our sessions. Mm -hmm. There's also a question or another comment, I think, from Nibby. Assume Kafka for original ingest and into ClickHouse for analysis, Postgres for transactional application data, Redis for caching. Influx DB for general stat, stat monitoring. There's a lot of stuff going on there. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty accurate, Nibby. Um, we, I mean, like actually, like there's no edits to that for the most part. ClickHouse we use for like logging for the most part, um, which is kind of like a new product we're working on. But um, we also use uh, Open Search. If you've heard of like Elastic Search, the mm -hmm. the sort of different version of it. Uh, I, I guess it's like. Yeah, the AWS version of it, we use that a good amount. Um, though we kind of are thinking about moving over to ClickHouse for that as well. So, um, but yeah, you kind of got it on, you hit the nail on the head, Nibby. Is all of that tech listed on the website? Like how did, how did they know that to start? <laughs> I actually don't know. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. I don't think we have it anywhere in particular. Okay. Um, but that's a good idea. We should put it somewhere to kind of yeah. just like call out the, the tech that we use at the end of the day. Um, wait, so James, you did you close? You ended up closing that tab. Uh, it should be closed. Yeah, I don't see. I can also. I'm getting used to Arc, so I can double check over here. Yeah, I don't have that tab open anymore. Oh, Nibby's got a great comment in the Docker Compose for self-hosting is where you have defined all the different technologies. That's such a good, <laughs> such a good call out. Yeah, neurotoxin says, excuse my ignorance, is this similar to log rocket? Mm -hmm. Yeah, neurotoxin, it's similar to log rocket in the sense of the session replay in particular. Um, I think kind of where we're going, well, first of all, the product is completely open source. Um, so folks can self host it, which is seems like Nibby was looking at that is kind of one big benefit. The second thing is that we're kind of being a little more ambitious with the rest of the stack. So beyond session replay, we want to build out like a logging product and an error monitoring product, which James will show us, um, and then kind of tie all those things together. Um, but yeah, I think it's a generally on the session replay side, it's a good comparison. That's a good call out. I just realized moving all the stuff in my office, I've got lights commands that can like turn on and off lights, uh, but those aren't working for chat. So sorry about that because I've been moving everything in here. Looking forward to give it a try. That's awesome. Good deal. Um, anything we should do to, cause it's still showing that live air. Should I open another tab and try, try another yeah, session? I'll do that. I would open a few and just like start testing it around, you know? Cool. Um, scroll, scroll, scroll. I wish I had like more interaction on here. There's not a whole lot I can actually like do on the site cause it's fairly minimal, but no worries. I also wonder that tab that I had open may have been an existing tab that um, 
that was open before changing the code, if that makes sense. Like there's a chance, because remember we changed the, um, the yeah, ID yeah. in here because I copied the wrong one. So there's a chance that that was like an existing tab. Um, this ought to at least like track a click on there, I think. Uh, but that should be one. Close that one. This will be another one that's been open for a little bit. Uh, Zane is joking. Hopefully you haven't hacked me that there should be like a JQQ laptop shutdown command <laughs> on Twitch, which there absolutely should not be. Um, so please don't do that. When um, what did you open... when did you start making these commands? I started them like several a couple years ago at least, and I just I haven't done it like I haven't interacted with them very much, so I haven't really like checked in. And yeah. I just did some updates the other day because I would like thought they would be more worthwhile for people because they are kind of fun. They are. They are. Um, I agree. Yeah. So it it like can be super cool, but a lot of the stuff. I have to like come back and tweet and tweak and actually get set up. So makes sense. Makes sense. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's try, let's try another refresh in here. Cool. There's tracking the live ones. Maybe they just haven't, cause it takes a few seconds after closing the tab for it to like recognize this thing has yeah. actually been finished. Right. Yeah. But it looks like for this one, for example, if you click play, check it out. Mm, like, yeah. Just, yeah. You will me... have, that's perfect. Let me zoom in, maybe. Oh, that's kind of pushing it the other way, because that, because I think the video player is based on the amount of screen space for the rest of the stuff. Can I? Can you make that full screen? Yes. Uh, there yeah. we go. Cool. So let's do that, and let's uh, just play through. So you can see, like this is what I was talking about before, where you can actually see the cursor dragging around, which is really wild. And then I think you explained this before. Like there's there's this gray spot in here, which is basically where I've like tabbed away. Is that right? So I went to another tab, nothing's happening, and it even marks that as as like empty, yeah. nothing's happening space. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We call them like inactive parts of the session. Mm -hmm. And um it kind of just helps you understand like where a user actually was doing something. So like if you're mm -hmm. debugging some sort of issue, you actually know what went wrong. You know what I mean? And you also, can see another think, one of those coming up here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, also, James, I think if you do a full refresh at this point, you might. Cannot Im Nibby said, cannot imagine the bandwidth this uses on your end. I mean, there's lots going on, but the, the cool thing is like from, from my perspective on my application, the performance is offloaded again to that like background thread type stuff uh, or worker threads exactly. so that I, I'm not worried about what's going on in my application. It's just your responsibility as an engineering team to make sure you're able to handle all that stuff. Yep, yep, yep. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's all on us. Um, but now, see, it says that some yeah. of, a few of them are processed. So now you mm -hmm. can actually click through these sessions. Sweet. And, uh, and what are the, I guess it shows, oh, cool. So this is, I was just curious what the colors are. So navigate, oh, it even shows you like the URL. That's cool. Yep. Yep. And then oh. viewport is, is that like a viewport change or is it like, does it look like that on the initial, like it shows you viewport on the initial load of the page? Is that right? It should, I think for the most part, it shows viewport on the initial load of the page. But then when a viewport change event happens, there's also a thing for that. Okay. Uh, we also got a question oh. about streaming in a higher resolution. Um, so from, Akash on YouTube, this that usually when people have comments like that, it's on their network. I would double check that that um, you can actually choose to on YouTube. You can override and just say not the default, but you can force it into 1080p or whatever. I would check your settings because I think I think everything on my end is configured to come through at 1080p. So hopefully, hopefully you can take a look and, and find that setting and and be able to see a higher resolution. James, and if not, I, let me know. I think he might be asking about highlight actually. Oh yeah, she he said shouldn't be more than streaming a 480p video. I wonder if he's asking about highlight. Maybe not. Oh, like that's what that's the work that you're doing, and it's even like to to Vadim's but, point. I think in the chat, he he said for for context, I can actually highlight this for everyone to see too. 
Um, the transfer is minimal. We store the replay as HTML DOM. So after the initial snapshot, the rest of the recording uses minimal diffs that are compressed. This is like, this is where it gets super cool, but also super in depth to the point of like, this is beyond like things that I had deep technical experience with, but super, super cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like basically to kind of close the loop there, the we don't actually store any video. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually there's a bunch of other comments that w- would be worth getting to, but um, we don't store any actual video, which is cool because that way we can kind of compress the data as Vadim mentioned. Um, and oh, yeah. that's, I didn't and realize you know, that. Wait, let's go back to, so if you right click. Yeah. If you inspect this, this is actually not a video. So this is um, an iframe. Is that what? Yeah. Go to, go to um, click the settings button on the on the under the replay section under what you're hovering right now uh wait what okay. sorry <laughs> yeah 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 now go down a little bit and click that settings toggle. oh the settings icon okay and then click um i think maybe you, you click the d click d actually just click d this is a bit like of a hidden thing that we have yeah, Inspect now it's oh, oh, interesting. And then if you now you oh, what? Yeah. Wow. Okay. We hadn't in our like talking before, I hadn't seen this. That's really neat. So this yeah. actually is just like it's just streaming. Uh, Arc has this thing that pops up that I don't like. I want that to go away because I can never click this oh. X. Um so you're literally just like storing those events and then you're able to to stream those through on here and it's actually just like a regular dom web page like it's just the website behind the scenes what's going on here yep exactly that's cool exactly exactly that's cool. Uh, okay. maybe it's worth going through a bunch of these questions real quick yeah. so can highlight be self-hosted um does all my user data have to be sent to us short answer is no and neurotoxin that's a good thing for us to kind of cover on the privacy end so i'll make sure mm-hmm. to come back to that a little later but the short answer is yes you can just self-host highlight and um you don't have to worry about anything on that front we also have sort of more enterprise plans if you want to like actually deploy a full cluster of highlight and all that kind of stuff but in and of itself like a simple just highlight deployment on an ec2 box is pretty easy to do and we have like a hobby deployment on our docs uh which i'm sure vadim can actually share in the chat um, and that goes back to the Docker Compose that Nibby was looking at earlier, because that yeah. would be the, like the self-hosted one, exactly. and that's where Nibby found out like here's all the technologies and stuff that it uses. Yep, 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 yeah, yep. Cool and ex- exactly. And and Neurotoxin, that's also a big benefit of why the, the open source thing kind of hits home, mm-hmm. right? Because, um, yeah, you kind of know what's going on on under the hood, even if you don't self-host. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that kind of goes over that. Is there a lot of aggregation on the back end or is there a very storage intensive product? <laughs> Seems like an engineering nightmare. I love that. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know. I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the engineering team we have here. And I think they yeah. do a great job. Vadim and Vadim's leading those efforts. We, they do a great job of, of kind of building all of the infrastructure behind the hood so that you at the end of the day shouldn't have to have to worry about any of that stuff. Right. And I hope it's clear that you just put a few lines of code and it just starts working, right? Mm-hmm. And that kind of will be the case for the for the rest of time, you know, is is our goal. But yeah, it is it is it is a lot of work, that's for sure. I don't know if I'd call it a nightmare, but it is a lot of work. <laughs> Fun challenge. I meant to. Hmm, it's YouTube. Uh, to compare the bandwidth requirement here, I guess I guess maybe that was your point of they akash was probably asking more about bandwidth on on the highlight side than the stream i think yeah yeah which uh, is funny because then who was it that commented um i thought someone commented after that and then said they moved to twitch and the oh rob above that commented they went to twitch and it was higher definition than youtube <laughs> so i guess there's a little bit of both of those things going on yeah i don't know what, if it was one or the other but yeah it, it, i think it's a fun it's a fun thing to talk about regardless so um, but Akash seems like he's getting kind of pretty excited about the mutation observer stuff. The, mm-hmm. Yeah, Akash, I think on your earlier comment at eleven twelve, 
you're totally right about the mutation observer. We actually use a library under the hood called RR Web, which Vadim can also link. Um, and we're good friends with those folks. They actually, uh, we, we, Justin, who's one of the core contributors there, um, we used to work with him pretty closely kind of in the early days of Highlight. But RR Web is basically a library that wraps the mutation observer and gives us as highlight a bunch of methods to make it easy for us to record and replay after the fact. And it's kind of like the building blocks, kind of like a level of abstraction on top of the mutation observer and is what we use to get that first snapshot of the DOM rather than just the diffs. So Akash was talking about like the diffs and how like the mutation observer only gives you diffs. Our web gives us this method called like snapshot and it gives us kind of like a, a mutation observer compatible representation. But maybe it's not worth going too deep in there, but yeah, Akash, for what it's worth, it might be look, fun to look, take a look at that next if you're, if you're interested in that kind of thing. Sweet. So I'm thinking we can, so we saw the sessions on the front end. We saw the session replay, talked about like some of the icons in here. You scroll through, see everything. We don't have any errors. And so to see errors, we're gonna go and update the back end to throw some code in there that will that will cause an error and then we're gonna have the front end call it and we'll see this full stack like full stack thing so that sounds great i i think uh, one thing actually that i want to talk about james here yeah. how are we on time uh we're fine i mean i i've got as much time as you do okay okay um i was thinking we could quickly just talk about some of the features in the replay okay um and there's a question in the chat that might also be relevant to where you're going about um like seeing trends for sessions i think this is similar to a question i asked you when we were chatting before too that's a good question um in short we don't i mean i think that's something we've considered in the long term but right mm -hmm. now we're just very focused on the sort of the debugging use case yep. of making it easier for people to like understand the bugs that happen and be able to play up to those things there's actually a few products out there that are more in the like analytics space for session replay. One of those products is Heap, if you've heard of them, mm -hmm. um, but they can help you with that. The only problem though, is that now you won't get like all the error monitoring and logging and things like that. So it's just a question of us, for us, like what audience we want to focus on. Um, but Nibby, that's a good point. I think, I think there's no doubt that the trends and the sort of more product analytics kind of stuff is pretty valuable. So um, not something we're focused on right now, but something we will we'll consider in the future for sure. And that was, Nibby, that was a very similar question to what I had. Because as I saw the replay, I was like, and you can see like them just moving all over the place. I was like, that's why you have so much. Yeah. But to your point, like got to really nail the core experience, but then you have all this data that you could layer on top of. So it'd be fun to, to, to see where that ends up being in a year, a couple of years, something like that. Yep, 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 yep. Exactly, exactly. Um. But cool. Okay, there, yeah. Yeah, yeah did James, you want to do a couple of features in here? Yeah, let's click into the network tab. Oh, cool. So this and, is full, like the original network tab. This is the full thing. Yep, yep. And so I think this is kind of pretty, like I, I imagine the audience is used to debugging things in the Chrome Dev Tools in their local machine, right? Where you can like search through all the requests that go out in a given session and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think maybe one thing that's worth kind of sell, like, I don't know, uh, emphasizing here is that highlight gives you that after the fact. So you, we can mm -hmm. see all these like super base requests that you make James in your app and you can debug them in production. So if you know that like a request was made and there's some error on the front end, you can actually understand that, okay, the error happened um, mm. because maybe this request failed yeah the response yeah. didn't didn't match my uh typescript type or whatever it was you know what i mean um so that's kind of one thing that i wanted to 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 um emphasize and if you click here right here just click go ahead and click right there yeah you can actually inspect the contents over there um and then yeah i think that yeah so that here you can actually inspect the contents and you know like the headers and re request and response of the request um, and yeah, so that's kind of how the request, the network request dev tools kind of stuff works. I cool. just figured it was worth kind of, kind of, uh, sharing a little bit more about that. It's but, really neat because you can see, and these are for context, these are all like the images that are loaded from the content page. So you can see each one of these. So if, for example, to your point, 
super base went out and my app didn't load, I would be able to see all those failed network requests in here. Yep. Yep. Cool. Exactly. Exactly. And then if you take a look at the console, this is sort of the last thing here. Here we actually report on all the logs that happened in your in your in your uh, session as well. Maybe there's something I did wrong in here, <laughs> which is kind of this whole thing, right? <laughs> so these are warnings, I think. So mm -hmm. they're not they're not particularly maybe uh, actionable. Like yeah. But, um, yeah. I mean, it's cool, right? Because you can now know that this warning could have caused a bug or whatever it was, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so. There's some cool things that could happen on that front. And I think the the high level like vibe is like in, you should just if you're debugging any issue, you should just have all the context you need to debug yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Like there's nothing better than like full context when it comes to 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 yeah. to these types of bugs. So and um, to go back to like the alternative or like what if I'm not using this like someone sends me a message and says like your website sucks and that's about it right like you can you could ask them to take a picture of their console or yeah, maybe or you, a picture of their network tab or whatever but it's not it's not you having all the data in a way that you can actually interact and, and kind of search and filter through yeah yeah and i think it's like yeah exactly exactly um it's just yeah the context thing i think is a big piece that we've just been really focused on and it's like I think even context going towards like your server side and all that kind of stuff is, is, is the next step, you know, cool. and where we're going anyway. But yep. um, yeah, James, the last thing that I want to talk about was something that I think neurotoxins mentioning about the privacy and the stored mm -hmm. data, which I was going to get to anyway, maybe while you're, well, well, I'll just quickly talk about that real quick, which is yep. if you hit, if you head over to our docs, and you just do a command K for privacy. I love this, by the way, the search with command K. Yeah, it's really nice. Shout out to Algolia once again. Does Al Algolia do the UI as well? Like what's the UI for doing the search, the like pop-up thing? Yep, they do it all. They do it all. Oh, so it's cool. just like a JavaScript okay. snippet. You stick yeah. the JavaScript snippet on your UI on the docs, and then you point them at your docs like URL and then they just do the pairing for you and figure it out for you. It's really nice. Um, but anyway, yeah. So, so on the privacy the end, no, you're good. You're good on the privacy end. Yeah. Just to quickly talk about that and then we can jump into the, like the back end stuff, but um, there's a bunch of ways that we make it easy for you to kind of redact data. The default way, especially for sort of more privacy centric use cases is uh we tell you to turn on strict privacy mode. So if you do a command F here, James, for strict privacy. I'm not used to the stream stuff. So every time someone comments, I like get distracted. Yeah, yeah, it's... I want to read the comment, but then I realize I'm still talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough and fun. I love, keep the comments coming. So we'll, John, we'll yeah, come back to the question in a second. Skill. It's a skill. I'm impressed by it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the, the on the strict privacy mode, um, it is really easy to just turn off all text content on highlight. So in that h.init method, James, if you want to go over to your code, in the h.init method, you can you'll get like type ahead for enable strict privacy, and you set that to true, it'll just not record any data. Okay. That is text. In other words, it'll convert like no. hello okay. world to just a bunch of jargon. So you and, won't see any text at all. And that way you, okay. yeah, exactly. And that way you don't actually, you can see, still see the skeleton of your UI, but you just won't see any text. You won't okay. see any like actual PII as they call it or privacy, like private, what is it? What does PII stand for? I know the acronym. Um, personally, identifiable. personally identifiable. Identifiable, yeah, there you go. Yep. Yes, nailed it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the that's kind of the the big power of that, and that's kind of like a default, right? If you want to install, install highlight for the first time and you're worried, to, you're like a bit worried about the privacy the privacy implications of it, that's a good thing to turn on. Um, if you want to go a step further and just kind of turn on specific parts of your UI, that's where what's above here, James, is a good a good fit. 
So we have a way to ignore input where you can just add the highlight ignore class to your UI. Mm -hmm. We have highlight mask, which lets you obfuscate elements. Um, and if you keep going, there's even more stuff. So there's just like a, a bunch of options for you to like be able to mask elements and redact them. Um, but a good default is always that strict privacy mode. Um, and yeah, neurotoxin, I think that kind of covers the, the privacy thing generally, but we're happy to answer more questions. And Vadim's in the chat if you have more follow-ups on that front. And John's question, um, server logging, monitoring, been playing with Promtail, Grafana, Loki for ser server logging. Is this something that could replace that? Um, do, do you consider, so I, I guess, is there a distinction between like air monitoring session replay and just like logging in general? Cause for me, like I, I mentioned using Logtail as an add on in Heroku to just be able to search through logs in general. Cause oftentimes like I may want like just info logs to be able to see what happened and maybe not necessarily errors. Is there a distinction there or is that something you would also potentially do like all encompassing with highlight as well? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a distinction. I would say that there are different types of logging tools or yeah. different types of monitoring tools for sure. Um, John, one thing that we've been working on actually is a logging product though. So if you had, if you want to do a command K here, James, for logging, I think it should probably just work. Um, we do have a not, yeah, just go to the third one maybe. I can logging. Just, no, no, not that. Oh, sorry. One. Just logging. Yeah, the last one. Uh, now it's the first one. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. There we go. There you go. So yeah, we have, we have like a logging product that's actually in beta, um, where we'll actually report on logs cool. across your app. Um, but it's pretty like, we're, we're still doing, we're still doing a lot of work on that space. And John, if you have more questions on that front and you would want to replace something like Loki or, um, Promptail with that kind of thing, that's definitely worth having a conversation and you should let us know. But, um, yeah, I mean, the reality is they are very different types of tools and they're used for different use cases. So they're all important in their own, in their own vein um, is how we think about it. Love it. Um, I'm going to semi-interrupt really quickly because uh, Will joined us on Twitch and got a promotion to a senior developer advocate, I believe is what the title is. So I'm going to throw a round of applause in there. Uh, congrats. Well, can you hear that, Jay, by the way? I can, I can. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I like I want to use my soundboard more often. Uh, anyway, shout out to Will Johnson on uh, on Twitch for the promotion. Yeah, shout out. That's awesome. That's awesome. What is uh, Starlight said? Oh, that was video. Didn't realize that I was thinking that James must be really taken with the hover effect on those black button. I don't know if I caught that. The I don't the hover effect on the black buttons. I don't know. Starlight, oh, help me. I know what he's talking about. Go to privacy. Go back to the privacy page. Uh, was this on a previous page that I was on? Yeah. Okay, the back thing might not Oh. Um, okay, I think I know what you're talking about now, too. Yeah, he's this talking thing. about black. Oh, so that I was just playing with the, like, hovering the whole time, just going back and forth? <laughs> exactly. That's hilarious. That that definitely feels like me, also. <laughs> very easily distracted <laughs> that's so good um also i need to i wonder if there, anybody use arc and know if there's a setting where i can turn this thing off from coming over when i scroll because i just typically don't want it if anybody knows that setting let me know look like you were very distracted <laughs> feels perfectly on brand for me i think um was there was there anything else you wanted to show like in the session replay dashboard or do you want to look at the back end part? No, I think we're in a good spot. Let's do the back cool. end part for sure. Okay. Um so I think I already yeah, so I've got the Express docs open. Again, two different applications. One is the Discord bot slash API, which is Node and Express TypeScript. Um the other part is the front end that we've been looking at in SvelteKit, and we'll kind of see these connected all the way through. Um the the first part here is is really important. I kind of glossed over the text the the first time that I read it, and I, I was like, "Why are we doing the same thing again?" But the point is, like, for your backend stuff to be connected to like the session full session replay and like tied into the thing that you'll get real value out of, your front end needs to be connected. You also need to have a front end connected so that you can have it like going all the way through. 
Yep. Yep. So this is more or less just making sure you already have done what we've already done. Right. And then uh, we can go ahead. I think this code is this way. So I'm going to start to uh, just add an NPM package in here. And uh, Nibby's got a question actually. If, if I'm going to kind of walk through these are some copy and paste things. So I'm going to do this behind the scenes. And Jay, if you want to answer the yes. question from Nibby there. Sure. Yeah. So the Nibby to answer your question on should I be doing this in development or production? Uh, I would, we, this is for production actually, Nibby. So this is something you turn on and we monitor all your um, errors, all the bugs that happen, and then you can actually play back anything that goes wrong. Um, so that's the intention. Some people use it in development, though it becomes less valuable in development just because um, you already have access to the dev access, tools, yeah. right? So it's, we're basically re reproducing the dev tools in your production apps, because obviously you don't have access to all your customers or your users, um, browsers. And that's sort of the power of highlight, if that makes sense. Um, so short answer is production for sure. Cool. Um, so I am going through just following the doc. So the first thing was to initialize the project. The next thing is to import the handlers. And in this case, the handlers are basically middleware that we're going to use in our application. And they need to then be used after all of our routes are defined, which basically means like a, a event, or I don't know if it's event propagation, but propagation in um, middleware land with uh, Express means like you kind of go down this, like hit this middleware, hit this middleware, hit the API, hit the endpoint defined by the developer. Then hit in this case the last middleware will be uh, will be highlight. Is that a fair explanation of that? Yep, yep, that's totally fair. And cool. so basically, when errors get propagated up from your actual requests, the idea is that highlight can catch it and report on it. Sweet. Um, so I am actually I left this code in from earlier. Did I forget to? I guess I did forget to remove this and sillily I was putting this in the wrong spot anyway. So it's a good thing I didn't do that. Going back to what we were supposed to be doing at the root of my express server, we um, imported H and handlers from, I don't know. I think VS code is just behind on the fact that I have this package because it's installed, uh, but we import those two things. We initialize this project and the correct ID is this one here. So that's the new one the one that we just created. And then at the bottom of all this, we reference the error handler and this ID again, and then tell it to use uh, those error handlers. So this is just throwing highlight middleware into the stack. All that still fair? Yep, yep, that sounds good. And uh, so up until this point, we've had a get members function that works the way it's supposed to where it returns the number of people inside of uh inside of discord i'm actually like i was gonna type some of this out but i think it's fair to just copy and paste this new snippet in here uh for reference what we have is two endpoints one has an async function callback one does not and we'll talk about the difference there in a second and i'm just gonna paste in kind of the updated version of these two things that incorporates highlight and we'll talk about this so two things to call out this get members function now has some terrible logic to uh, half of the time throw an error that says my code sucks so that we can kind of show sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, neurotoxin, the spelling of your command has to be specific. So random and then capital T, this should be fun. So try that one more time with a capital T and it should work, fingers crossed. Uh, so this was, this was just kind of force us to throw an error about 50% of the time. It's kind of like playing roulette or something like it's it's just a it's just an odds thing and then uh this function actually stayed the exact same so nothing we didn't add anything to this synchronous api endpoint callback what we did add though is inside of the async one because of the way that error handling works with express.js and async uh callbacks in this case we're specifically like telling highlight to consume this error so they have a function to parse the headers from the request and then you use that to say, hey, uh, highlight, you just handle this thing because it didn't get picked up automatically because of the way the propagation of errors works. Does that still sound correct? 
Yep, yep, that's exactly right. So that consume error basically sends back data to highlight, but then beyond that, even attributes the incoming request with the error that you sent. Yep. And so I guess it's a good, maybe this is a reasonable time to reference. We have this, we have this idea of session that's tracked in the, in the front end. It, somehow that's then being attached to like the back end. So from these headers, it's able to parse something that references that session. What, what is in those headers that associates the session going back and forth to the server? Yeah, so it's just basically a unique. It's a like it's a unique ID. Cool. So before, but like when the when the when the request happens, James, when you use something like fetch or whatever mm -hmm. library you're using on the front end to send out the request, highlight basically attaches a header to that outgoing request um, and generates a unique ID before that request gets sent out. And then on the back end, when we grab that ID here in your middleware, we know that okay. There's a set like this ID was attributed to this session and then do the pairing for you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Perfect. Um, one like selfish shout out, by the way, since we're neurotoxin, you should do the random theme again. But for reference, I haven't really shared this very much. This is actually the James Q quick theme for people that are interested. So you can actually install this theme on your own VS code if people want to. What uh, what say it what? Look? It's the color theme that you're seeing right now. Nice. Like the yeah, so the green and blue and purple. Yeah. So everything that you see right now is that theme. I like it. I like it. Uh cool. So I think uh we can start this. So this is the back end server starting. And what we should be able to see is if we go to API slash server insights, we get the data back, we refresh. Uh James's code sucks. Obviously, refresh, James's code sucks. Obviously, now it's happening several times in a row. So uh, at this point, I'm just showing that we're able to trigger that error in something um, half the time or whatever based on the randomness. Like we're able to trigger that error. And then what we'll do, again, I'll I'll just undo the code and go back to what I had. So this is what I had originally. So what happens in here is this is going to make a fetch request, uh, kind of similar to what you just said, to uh, the server insights endpoint, which is running locally. It uh, has a bug in here where it tries to automatically convert this to JSON, even though the response, if there's an error, isn't JSON. So we'll actually see that error. And then lastly, it uses some Svelte kit syntax to say like, here's a loading state, here's the appropriate state, and then here's an error message state if something errors out, which it doesn't actually trigger this. To, or maybe it does. I can't remember if... Anyway. Um, that's kind of a different specific issue with like how fetch is coming back to us because fetch doesn't technically error. It gives you back a status of 500, like a success, successful response with a status of 500. So it won't trigger the catch. So this won't actually render. That's a separate point. But uh, so at this point, if I'm correct and double check me, like we should be able to go to the front end of the website to the server insights endpoint. We'll refresh a few different times every or about half of the time it will call the back end the back end will fail and then we'll be able to track like that full error session thing stuff through yep. the dashboard is that right exactly exactly yeah. yeah so it'll all be connected is what is is kind of yeah. the, the... <laughs> much better way to put it <laughs> <laughs> error cool. session things will be connected error yeah. session thing stuff all of which will be connected love it um i don't think i have a tab open so let's go to here, so homepage, um, and then I actually want to go to server insights, and you can see this says undefined. If I actually look inside of uh, the console, we'll actually see the log. So it throws an error saying that we can't uh, we can't parse JSON because it didn't actually respond JSON. Which at this point, after I see this error, lets me know that like I need to do something different with this. And what would be different is like checking res.status and comparing res.status against like failed statuses myself versus just like assuming it's going to take care of things appropriately for me. But I should be able to refresh a few different times. So that failed again, that failed again, that there we go. So there's the five again. This is just like, this is just the odds of gambling. <laughs> it's the, it's the interesting thing where you can have, I don't know if you gamble at all, but like if you play roulette and you bet on, <clears throat> red and it's not red and you assume it'll be red eventually like they have a double down strategy it'll be red like no 
being read 25 times in a row doesn't have any more likely of being read the next time. Like it's 50, it's actually less than 50%, but it's going to be the same percentage every time, regardless of history. Yep. <laughs> uh, so, oh, sorry. What did I, I don't even know what I, oh, I clicked on the discord link. Not what I wanted. Uh, so that should be good. Should I close this tab out to like finish that session? Mm, yeah, it can't hurt. Can't hurt to do that. But I, I guess the kind of the hesitation is the errors. We'll, we'll be able to view the errors regardless of whether or not the session is still going. Is that right? Yeah, you shouldn't even be able to view the session. I feel like if it's still <clears> going, <throat> we might look, be in a weird state given the live stuff we we just looked at. So okay. we'll have to see. Um, should I start I, on the, yeah, let's, should we go to errors or? Yeah, let's see what errors looks like. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I feel like we should screenshot or clip this because like here's an error that says James's code sucks. That's gotta happen like a lot. <laughs> yeah, you should have said Jay's code sucks. Mm, I should have. That would have been maybe next much time. safer for me and my brand. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what all do you wanna like kind of call out some of the pieces of information that are here? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, so you refresh that page a few times. So like we're on we're on what we like to call like the error, the single error group view. So basically highlight, like a lot of other error monitoring tools out there, will like group errors such that similar errors are kind of like grouped together as a group, right? Mm -hmm. um, underneath an error group, we have multiple error instances. And so um, here you can see that there's multiple instances and you can click older and newer to go between those instances. Um, but then you can also see that, okay, there was one affected user, which presumably was you. Um, there was eight instances at the top. Um, and then you can see that what happened over the last 30 days, right? So obviously all those eight instances happened today. So you can sort of see a general trend line. Um, beyond that, we give you access to, okay, the error body looks like this, right? And this is like, if you want to like make it, yeah, if you want to make it bigger, that's kind of everything that was there. But then beyond that, if you scroll down a little bit, and I don't know if this will be set up for you. Do you want to scroll down on this page? Yeah, Stack there trace. is a fact trace. And, I, and this is not something in the scope of maybe what we set up today, but like you can set up source map enhancement mm -hmm. such that will, uh, Highlight will automatically enhance those source maps. But here you can see that, okay, this was the point at which this error happened. It was in function.log error of some internal uh, uh, express library, right? But ideally, if the, if the source map enhancement was there, you kind of get a little bit better visibility there. But in any case, yeah, that's kind of how it works. It's pretty simple. Cool. And then this, <clears throat> going back to the top part, this is taking me to server insights, and then it actually tells me, sorry for the swipe, uh, 13. So 13 is actually where we throw that error. So it actually showed me like, the line on the server side of where that thing went wrong. James, yep. James, if you open the other error, the one below on the left side, then you'll also see a more detailed stack trace that's actually pointing to your code. Oh, that's a good point. Oh, this one, yeah. By the way, Vadim and Jay, for context, uh, actually, we shouldn't tell, like, th th that should just be like the Wizard of Oz voice in the background, and we shouldn't give context, but the word of the word of the word, <laughs> words of wisdom that's right um and what remind me what the difference between these two was so there's two it's kind of doing this twice one is node express just handling it and then the other is like actually handling yeah. from highlight if i were to guess one of them is uh node spitting out the error. they're both backend errors mm -hmm. and one of them is express the express middleware catching it and writing console.error. And mm -hmm. then the second one is highlight catching it and it being passed through that consume error call. Um, so they're kind of just at different levels of the stack, if that makes sense. But cool. in any case, the nice thing about this error specifically is that you get that get members call, right? Yep. And then we can dig into where that was called, where that was called, and go down the chain. So you get lots of details in here. Yep, yep, exactly, exactly. So um, now... Let's jump into this, right? So if you go to James Code Sucks, the bottom one, maybe? Uh, you talking about over here? 
Yeah. Okay. And we click in show session. Yeah. This is like the culmination, by the way, of like, where's my <laughs> this might drum be roll? This might is be it session, so it might not go back. Click back. Uh, just back in here. Yeah, and let's go to the other error. See if that one kind of gives us this one here. Yeah, try that one. And then show session. Hmm. Is it maybe just like still propagating the information for that session? Yeah, just try a hard refresh maybe here. Oh, there oh, we go. There we go. That might just be a small bug. But basically, yeah, now now if you click into that error, so so see where the see where the timeline indicator is on the UI? Click on that red box and you click into errors, mm. you know that this error actually happened here now. Um, okay, yeah. So you can actually cool. now play through, like if you play back, yeah, start from the beginning, you now know where the James Code Sucks error happened in the first place. Yeah, that's cool. Um, by the way, like a small, small thing, as we mentioned this earlier, I think it's the purple is the screen resize. So you can actually see when it goes through the purple. That's when I do like resize the screen because I open up the terminal to show the logs. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And then we see the errors in here. And then um, one super random thought, but Chris <laughs> Christian mentioned, like I think 10, 15 minutes ago, that Java backend support yeah. missing. Um, we we do actually have some folks in our Discord community that are helping us with the backend SDK. So Christian, if you want to be a part of that or you want to take a look or something like that, just just let us know. You should be able to be just search in session replay, help session replay. Uh, for Java, and you might be able to find that. But anyway, yeah. So going back to the replay thing, James, the cool thing, yeah, now is that you can actually, from an error that happens on your back end, actually understand what a user did leading up mm -hmm. to that. You know. Yep. In this case, it didn't take much. It was just me writing terrible code. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The the tying, like the the. Session replay is pretty incredible, like on its own, but also tied into the full stack ness um, is is pretty sweet. Because again, think about like the the maybe someone now says like, "Hey, I just tried your website and something happens." Now I can go look at like time period or time range and see specific errors that popped up. And maybe um, maybe this is relevant to a question in the chat too. So like that's one example of someone messages me and says, "Hey, this thing didn't work." Is there also the idea of notification? So Nibby was asking specifically about like error rates at a certain threshold, but I'm even going like that. I still want to hear that answer, but also just like, can I get an email every time an error occurs? Yeah. So check out alerts. Click into alerts, James. Hmm. So this this will take. Hmm. Okay. Maybe it's not worth setting up right now. Yeah. But. Yeah, you can do that. So we have like alerts for errors and you can set it above a specific threshold. So maybe for example, you could say, I want to only alert errors if they happen more than X number of times within a specific time range. Um, and then you'll get an alert to Slack or you'll get an alert to email or whatever you prefer. Um, that way you can actually sort of debug what exactly went wrong, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. We also have alerts for new sessions. So like if that it's a bit, it can be a little noisy if you have like a lot of <laughs> sessions on your app. Yeah. Um, we also have alerts for new users. So we have a way to identify users in your app. I think we didn't cover this, but the there's like on the session, there's like a little ID, right? And right and by default highlight is random ID, but you can actually say that this is a specific user. Mm. So we have Alerts for that specific, for like specific users, new users that come on your app and you can actually play through what their onboarding flow was like. Um, and so there's lots of sort of alerts around the replay and around the error monitoring that can kind of get you to the right issues that happen, if that makes sense, maybe. So this is, I think you, so this is saying <clears throat> require Slack. I think you mentioned email as well is, can you do an email integration separate from Slack or do you have to start with Slack? I think you have to start with Slack right now, okay. but we do have an email integration. So okay. I think it's just a matter of click new alert, maybe. Yeah, I think if you go ahead and like go through the flow, we can do this later. But if you go through the flow, 
there is a way hmm. to say emails to notify. Yep, exactly. exactly. Oh, and webhooks. That's a nice one too, because that means that I could write code that does like enters it into Jira or like whatever. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yep. Cool. Exactly. Exactly. Sweet. There was one, one question. Uh, I think it's in this one. So version. So we didn't touch on this and we just kind of took like environment as production. So most likely running locally, it's not going to be in production. Um, or it'll be like a different project or something that we track separately as we're doing development. So uh, this would be actually tagged for production, but then also the version, this would be able to associate like the version of the website that people were running. And in this case, the example is like based on a uh, commit uh, ID. So I take the commit ID, put it into here. You could probably like, I think in like um ci cd servers you can get reference to that and put it as an environment variable and reference it in here probably as well like the the most recent commit so yep. that way you're able to track like errors interactions also associated with versions of your app based on either a tag or a commit or whatever you want to track yeah exactly so i don't even know i don't i don't know if we talked about this earlier but in svelte kit i wonder if there's a way to access the commit sha is there do you know I don't know right offhand. I think we mentioned that before the stream and I don't know if there is. I think you could probably get access to that. Like probably Netlify, Vercel, they probably give you environment variables like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. That does Netlify. make sense. That does make sense. But I think, I think that the, maybe the, so like I think Next.js, for example, lets you, it actually exposes a like dot build SHA or something in your actual uh, in the actual Next.js JS deployment. And I wouldn't be surprised if Vercel and Netlify also do this. So, but, yeah. but you'll just have to pass that through Netlify. But yeah, James, you're right. The, basically uh, that- Something, that, yeah. Yeah, that version is exactly what you said. Um, and it, it, it'll just help you, like if you're playing through a session to understand like what version mm -hmm. of my app was I actually playing through, you know? Uh, Nibby's got some comments saying you could do that with like GitHub workflows, for example. Yep, and then yep. also integrated into Docker file, I guess. Docker's beyond, I don't use Docker, so I don't actually know to confirm that or not. But yeah, tapping into um, tapping into that commit, something automatically to associate it with, with the highlight code that's running is probably the way to go. Yep, yep. Like basically cool. whatever environment you're running CI in, uh, you mm -hmm. have, really would have access to the git commit SHA, and then you just want to pass that through to your actual web app. Cool. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, that's um, kind of that's kind of how the alert stuff works. Um cool. And I mean, I don't know, James, what do you think? Should we should we uh maybe close maybe just like yeah, last last couple of questions, mate, because that was like I think that was all the things that we specifically wanted to show. And we've had great questions and, and conversation along the way, which is fantastic. So thanks everybody for participating. Yeah, no, I, um, yeah. so just to close things out, I mean, I first of all, thanks everyone for listening. This was fun. And thank, James, thank you so much for having us. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been fun to work with you these past couple of weeks as well. But um, I think to close things out on the highlight end in particular, uh, we really encourage people to, to join our Discord community and kind of get started with using it um, or contributing to the app. Um, so we're kind of generally open and we have like a lot of like our whole engineering team is in the discord community. So happy to get engaged there if people are interested, but beyond that, even be after the stream, if you guys have feedback or comments on, on what we're doing here, we're happy to help out in the community as well on that, on that front. Um, but yeah, generally it was really fun. And uh, I uh, I'm excited kind of to, I'm kind I'm excited to just see, what comes of this and see folks get engaged after this and all that fun stuff. Yeah, I think that's perfect. And I added link to the community page, our uh, community, which takes you to discord and the chat. So people can join there. If, awesome. Um, I think your email was actually on like one of the docs we were looking at at J at highlight dot IO. Yep. You can do yep. that. If people forget how to reach out or whatever, feel free to reach out to me and I can, I can get you connected. Uh, but discord is probably, the way to go. Starlight just joined, which is perfect. 
Um, and I will, so this has just been on kind of like dummy testing branches so far, but my plan is to have this in learn, build, teach going forward. so I'll be able to do all this stuff, uh, in the future. So if anybody breaks the site or has, has a bad experience with the site, uh, let me know and I should be able to go back and, and debug and see the full session replay. Yep. Yep. And it'll be cool. Cause you should set up, you can set up some alerts and like, I don't know, it would be nice to maybe even see if folks, uh, see when folks kind of report errors and be able to click through all that kind of stuff. So that makes sense. That makes sense. Excited for you to use it. But yeah, even beyond that, it's just fun to kind of get involved with your community. And um, thanks again for having us, James. This was really fun. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks everyone for watching, asking questions again. Um, if you're on Twitch, I'm going to raid you over to bald bearded builder, which is always a mouthful to say. So I'll send everybody on uh, Twitch over there in a couple of seconds. But thanks one more time for everybody for watching. And uh, we will catch you later.